Ja, herzlich willkommen zur oh, 10. Welcome to the 10th edition of Bo Global, with the title Europe at a Crossroads, the war in Ukraine and what it means for Europe. My name is Antonia Nord. I'm the head of the international department at the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Dear friends, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, in the third week after the beginning of the Russian invasion in Ukraine, the situation of hundreds of thousands of people is worsening daily. The bombardment, the shelling of a maternity clinic, uh, yesterday was one of the sad moments of this war, which has already cost so many civilian lives. We all see the pictures of destruction and death on a daily basis, and we read of uh, alleged flight corridors, which still not allow any people fleeing or which cannot be maintained. And we are witnesses of a humanitarian crisis. Despite the actions of the Russian army, the resistance in Ukraine is massive. The people there are fighting for their survival, for the survival of the state and their society. Today, we would like to talk about the possibilities for action in Germany and Europe to end this war and what the consequences of this war of aggression are for the German and the European policy. The previous Ostpolitik of dialogue and interdependence with Russia has obviously failed. It was parallel to a more and more aggressive foreign policy of Russia, and this was not seen in Germany or Europe, or people did not want to see it, although many people did see it, in particular people who have looked into the situation in Syria, for example, they saw clear signs here, but all in all, these voices were not really heard in Germany or in Europe. So what are the consequences? Today, we also want to look at the situation within Ukraine, and we would like to discuss the demands of the civil society in Ukraine towards Germany and uh, Europe. And I'm quite glad that our colleague Sofia Olinik is with us today. We have a, her here from Ukraine. She's the program coordinator for uh, democracy, support and human security. And I will have a discussion with her in English at the beginning. And then I will introduce all the other panelists and we will continue with our discussion. One technical remark, there will be a simultaneous uh, interpretation from German to English and vice versa. And you can see this globe symbol at the bottom of your screen where you can select the language. And we will give you the opportunity after the discussion to raise questions. There's a Q&A tool. Uh, F and A at the bottom. There you can submit your questions and my colleague will read them out here in the podium, in the panel, and she will also collect similar questions. Sorry, I have to switch the channel here. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us under these very difficult circumstances. Um, you said yesterday that you think it's important that Ukrainian voices are heard in this war. And that's why we are great, very grateful that you are here today with us. Um, Sophia, we uh, read a lot on social media, on Twitter, um, and, and, and we watch all, this, all these videos about the war. But can you tell us, how do people around you cope in the face of so much daily horror news? And for you, it's not only news, it's, 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 it's the new reality. Um, how do they continue to live in the midst of this humanitarian catastrophe? Uh, thank you, Antonia, and uh, thank you to everyone for organizing this discussion. It's, uh, yes, indeed, it's important that Ukrainians are also participating in such kind of events regardless how difficult it is. But uh, I think this gives also the perspective how the situation on the ground looks like. Uh, 
yes, for us, the situation that we see, the worries that is going around, it's it's not something from the news or the TV that we see. It's the reality that we live. And this is uh, the reality we faced uh, on 24th of, uh, of February, early in the morning, when the first uh, uh, explosion started. And that's the 16th day that we live in this. On the one hand, uh, it's like uh, you you consider it when when someone is asking you how are you and you say I'm good I'm good means like I have electricity heating and my and I don't have shooting above my head that's the new way we describe how good it is but uh, for many people for many of our colleagues and uh, and uh, our partners it's not the case we have our two colleagues and families still in cave region where the explosions are literally every day. We have uh, everyone around Ukraine spread it around and we are in touch only online. And the situation we follow every day, how it's happening and what's going on. And uh, whether there are any air alarms or not. Like today we had two air alarms uh, already after a couple of days of silence and our morning started at 4.30. So you never know when it's gonna go. And that's how you, you live with this. You, you have the feeling occasionally of helplessness, but on the other hand, uh, like, because uh, how can you save, how can you do more? to improve the situation. On the other hand, you, there is this like a, a huge feeling of support and um, solidarity among each other because everyone is doing what, what he or she can do. And uh, either it's volunteering or writing and spreading information or it's taking care of the, of the neighbors or taking care of our own families that they're also safe and sound. And the, the war that we face is like, it's complex. It's, it's a military threat that we face. And uh, I still don't know like uh, how it will be. Uh, like I'm looking forward for the day we will all return to Kyiv to return to our office and to our normal life in Kyiv. But on the other hand, uh, and this is what I'm, I'm not saying when uh, if the war will be over. I'm saying when the war is going to be over, we want to return to Kyiv and we want to keep our normal lives there. And uh, because it's uh, all of us have their life there, and I'm sure like plenty of people around, they would like to return to their homes, and then not uh, spending the whole day just keeping the phone. Whether did I miss something? Are there any updates? You spend your lunch time having your phone in your hand and checking like, oh, did the negotiations bring any result? Is there going to be a humanitarian corridor and the people will be evacuated? Are my friends safe? Are they in shelter? And that's that's the last two weeks we, we live in, just checking in how is each of us is coping and helping and doing what we can, but at the same time trying to uh, to, to have hope and to do what we can uh, just to go through all this. And uh, yeah. it's it's heartbreaking when I see the news about Mariupol, about uh, Bucha, Irpin, where our partners are, and uh, you every every day you think like. Uh, are they going to respond? Is, are they going to be safe? And uh, for, for us, it's not just a piece of news. It's some. It's the cities where some friends, partners, families live, or where we've traveled, or where we have some memories about. Yeah, thank you very much. It's indeed heartbreaking, Sophia. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on the situation of civil society organizations and our partners? How has the work of, of, of these organizations changed? Um, and, and what can we do as, as HBS to, to help them, to support them? Uh, the situation has drastically changed for everyone. Like uh, if uh, still at the, in February we were discussing what kind of a projects we can do, what uh, urban development uh, initiatives we can support, or one of the most uh, anticipated for me personally was one of the visits to Mariupol in September this year. This is what we were planning and hoping to do. But now we see like we tried uh, to support our partners as much as we can. And I'm grateful for the opportunity that we can still provide some minimum funding, but uh, we still need to support and do more. Because uh, at the moment there are partners who have solely support from us and, no, and they don't have any resources except of us. There are partners who are volunteering and they're spending the whole days and nights uh, distributing uh, or collecting humanitarian aid, uh, doing any kind of a possible and impossible things just to save people, to relocate, uh, uh, 
this is like literally their format of work has totally transformed into diff a different area. We have those who have a capacity or, but, uh, or have a, this voice that they can use for advocating and advocacy and preparing of data and analysis or doing advocacy beyond Ukraine as much as possible. Then they do, there are these kind of work that they can do. But uh, we see, like there is, there is a, uh, there are, there are those who can men who still have uh, have an, a capacity and resources for advocacy or preparing some analytical work, but at the same time there is like a big majority of them who are combining or refocus totally on supporting each other and supporting uh, the like to be like literally putting the focus on humanitarian aid and support. We have partners where half of the staff are right now, uh, like they're trying to stay in Kyiv and trying to help people there. And uh, we shouldn't underestimate if they are not doing the trainings or uh, some big fora or being visible as their thematic experts, it doesn't mean they didn't do their job. They just do what, what's currently is important because we, we do get a lot of support within the, uh, within the community in Ukraine. We get a lot of support coming uh, uh, from beyond Ukraine, but still more need to be done because if uh, eight years ago, that was a case, uh, like uh, we saw the revolution when, when the wave came and everyone mobilized, and then we saw the war has starting and, and it was again, the big massive wave of uh, solidarity mobilization. What we see right now is again, the time when everyone is doing what they can to, to, uh, to, to join their forces. But in this case, we see the threat is uh, not limited to one city or region. The threats that we face, the shellings that are happening, they are in every city and in every region regardless. You cannot say there are uh, the, the risk super safe in one place because you never know what's going to happen next and you live in this constant anxiety of what's going to be next whereas you like you don't plan more than one day or like if you have a luxury to planning it for longer perspective it's excellent and in in this case i say like uh, what we need to do more is a we should start a support civil society and activists as because in terms of what they do for right now like lots of volunteering and lots of support was beyond their not regular work and life. They leave their jobs to just to, to, do, to help others and we cannot leave them at the moment. Another thing is that we need to, they need to know that they have a back also in, in Germany and beyond like a political back that uh, they can rely on us and, uh, and we represent their support as well, that there are solid voices in a political level that the governments of the countries, they, they hear and they see what's happening, the real situation, because we face a massive disinformation happening and there are speculation of facts like literally every day. I'm, I'm dealing with one of the projects where, where we are trying to provide actual data on what's yeah. on the situation in Ukraine. But this is what we need. We need more voices that would, would be advocating the, for Ukraine in terms of uh, I would I will repeat, and I know that many already have told this. We need to close the sky because there is a danger. We can uh, there are air alarms every day, and uh, we had air alarm one hour ago, and this is like what what we need to protect. We need a protection. Mm -hmm. We we had a Versailles. There was a Versailles summit yet, uh, yesterday and continues today. There is a support from the EU to support Ukraine in phase of European integration. We need this to happen because what's happening in Ukraine is this like if we this is the cost of price and democracy we have, and this okay. is pretty high uh, price we pay. Yeah, I know. Are there other concrete demands or wishes uh, uh, towards the international community or Germany in particular, apart from a no no fly zone? Which yeah, this is this is what we see right now. That's like uh, one of the latest is this the further support of European integration because we see that there is a, an mm -hmm. EU accession because the discussion right now is uh, that there are member states that are in favor, but we see like there is a uh, quite uh, like quite slow or rather careful reaction uh, from among all, also Germany is very careful with any promises and we need to as a green foundation we need to advo advocate more and explain what's happening in Ukraine why Ukraine need more EU why Ukraine need more Germany to support us this is like a, 
it's there it starts both because the humanitarian aid we get we get lots of uh, over the years uh, there was a lot of support in terms of a reform sector mm -hmm. but we need right now also the defense this is what we, we cannot just have a discussions and uh, like we cannot drop the we, we have to be careful and we have to have more military support when uh, when we have missiles flying above our heads and we have people host taking hostages in number mm -hmm. of cities and not being able and they're spending weeks in the basements this is not the life we anyone would like to have yeah another thing is mm -hmm. it's yeah. again if it, there should be yes this week there was uh, more severe sanctions coming regarding uh, gas independency in terms of having uh, and the sanctions against Russia, they should continue further on, because and we shouldn't stop because again this is every day we lose people, yeah. And the sanctions should continue further on. Yeah, thank you, Sophia. We will definitely take up uh, the issues you raised here with our panelists. Is is there anything you would like to add? Um, is is there anything that gives you hope in this situation? Uh, it gives me hope because I'm still staying in Ukraine, and uh, and if I if I have hope, then if I'm here, I have hope, and I and it's my country. It's like my family is here, and my family, my colleagues are here, their families are here, my friends, and uh, like we we are here because we understand that we we want to stay here because this is our country, but this is where we work every day to make it a bit better place, and like. Uh, uh the one where we want to continue living and not uh, running away because uh, because of the missiles of course if it's a threat of your to someone's life we leave but yeah. everyone we want to stay here and uh, i've seen today's uh, sociological research data and they say people do have hope like 90 90 say they do have hope that uh, that it will be resolved but let's let's be frank it's two weeks only let's check uh, like and i want to be and i want this mood i would like it to continue but people are anxious about every single day but uh, yes, I would. I do have hope that it will end better sooner than later. But uh, for it to to end sooner, both on the global level, there will need to be a bigger, more solidarity and support in terms of FESA sanctions, closing the sky, FESA European accession and integration. Uh, and on the level of us as foundation, we need to support more of our partners and provide help and assistance to them, and also to advocate uh, in, uh, in Germany and beyond, where we have a capacity explaining what's happening in Ukraine and how the local governments, how the national governments can influence and have to, they can support pro-Ukrainian agenda. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sofia, for this very moving report. Um, and as I said before, we will discuss the issues you raised uh, with the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Antonio. Okay, dann möchte ich jetzt das Podium vorstellen für die Diskussion. Wir wechseln wieder zu Deutsch. So let us introduce the panelists and I will speak German again. Um, ich möchte sehr herzlich vorstellen Ochen Wagner. Very happy to welcome Robin Wagner. He is member of the Deutsche Bundestag for the Green Party. And he's also a member of the Parliamentary Commission dealing with the European Union and thus very much involved in the debates about Russia and Eastern Europe. And I'm also happy to welcome Dr. Sabine Fischer. She is an expert with the SWP. She's experienced in the field of Eastern Europe and the Middle East. And she's often been invited to comment on the situation in Eastern Europe and in other countries. She's also a member of our transatlantic working group. A very warm welcome to you. And I'm happy to welcome my colleague, Johannes Vosswinkel. He's the director of the HBS office 
in um, Moscow. He's right now in, sorry, in Kiev. He's right now in Berlin for evident reasons. He was in Russia before, but also in Vienna, and we are happy to have him with us. A very warm welcome to all of you. Robin, I would like to start with you. Sophia had mentioned a number of demands like a no-fly option, for example, which would mean an immediate military intervention of Europe. She also mentioned embargoes. Now, what are the options Germany and the European Union have? From your point of view, what would be smart in terms of a move? Yeah, these forderungen um werden ja sehr laut erhoben und immer wieder erhoben und ich kann das absolut gut nachvollziehen aus der ukrainischen Perspektive. These are demands which are being made time and again and I do understand why people ask for these initiatives. I am often participating in working groups and meetings with members of parliament from Ukraine, for example. So I know about these demands. As far as the sections are concerned, I think it's important that Germany checks what tools we have at hand, what we can do in order to escalate and what we should do in order to go beyond what we have been doing so far. However, we don't know for how long we have to keep up those sanctions. And actually, my heart tells me, do all this, but my mind says, well, we need to have a political analysis as well. We need to check how long we can do all this. It doesn't make sense to adopt lots of sanctions or programs which you cannot keep up. So that's what the federal government has to do. They need to analyze and check what sanctions we can undertake and what impact they have for the German economy and for the German population. I'm talking about gas and mineral oil first and foremost, of course. I mean, the Green Party wanted to go for a very different approach, but this was on a completely different basis. We would like to see much more in terms of renewable energy sources. However, alas, I have to say, we haven't done enough in Germany in those past years. We've been very dependent on Russian energy supply, that's gas and oil. That's bad, but it doesn't help me much. It doesn't help me to go and complain about what we have not done in the past. We need to check now. What can we do now? Also, wir haben es mit I'm einem checking Krieg. how long we can keep it up. We also need to check what the price is we will have to pay, and we will have to pay a price, and this will be a major one. But then we are fighting for democracy, and I'm very much in favor of paying the price, but we need to bear in mind that this will go on for a long time. So we need to analyze analyze to analyze the current situation and what the impact is going to have. And we need to see the overall context and situation, i.e. we need to also see what Russia will do. And we need to ask ourselves, what can we do in order to become more independent, less depending on Russia, on Russian energy? And what can be done in order to speed the process up? I mean, this is about long-term programs. And in the long run, we need to be independent from these energy sources in order to get out of this trap all over Europe. So as I said, it's going to be difficult, but we need to be willing to pay the price. And I am very much in favor to furthermore look at oil and gas. Now the no-fly zones, that's another story. I mean, once again, I do understand that people ask for it. And it's horrible to see the airborne operations undertaken by Russia. 
But the question is, what can we do in order to militarily impose a no-fly zone, which would mean actually to not only establish a no-fly zone, but to use NATO forces in order to shoot Russian aircraft, not only in the Ukrainian airspace, but also beyond. This will have an impact, and this might be, or this might have a dramatic impact. So, for the time being, we know that an immediate military intervention is really dangerous. <clears throat> Absolutely, there is also a consensus as far as the military intervention is concerned um, in all parties. But coming back to the embargo, what about other financial sanctions? What could be done? I mean, could we do more than we are doing right now? Well, sure. I mean, we could check whether we go for oil only and stop importing oil. Or we can also check what we can do in order to have a full embargo, i.e. an embargo without any avoidance, i.e. not any business which would like to, which would go around this embargo. But we always need to see the impact. What will be the impact? What will be the financial result of what we are doing for Russia, but also for others? And for how long will we have to keep it up? So the question is always, how much can we take? Savina Fischer, would you like to add something to these um, reflections? Well, thank you for your invitation. I think events like this one are extremely important in those times, and I'm very grateful to, to the Heinrich Bell Foundation for having, for hosting this round. Now, in addition to what Robin has just said, I would like to also comment on the impact for Germany and for Europe. Economic sanctions will have an impact. But we also need to see these sanctions under the aspect of social or societal cohesion. You all know that as far as Russia, Ukraine and the conflict are concerned, the situation in Germany was quite precarious as far as attitudes are concerned, right? Right now, there seems to be a social consensus as far as the support for Ukraine is concerned. Russia, on the other hand, is being seen as the aggressor. So the offensive, the war offensive has changed attitudes and views in Germany too. Recent polls show that a majority in Germany is also willing to bear the cost of the sanctions and measures undertaken, i.e to do what Robin Wagner has just mentioned, pay the price. The problem is, however, the bigger the burden, the more at stake will the cohesion be. So we need to make sure that we take everybody along so that the policy we are adopting in view of Russia and Ukraine has a possibility to be sustained in Germany in a democratic context. A, we need democratic pillars for these measures, and that's a fundamental aspect, I'd say, a prerequisite. Now, this was my additional remark with respect to what Robin has just said. Another aspect I would like to tackle, also in terms of strategies, and perspectives is displacement and flight from Ukraine. I mean, we are seeing already now that this is a major refugee movement and it can be compared to what we saw 
in World War II, and that's only the beginning of a development we are seeing. We need to be realistic here. And here again, right now, we do see a lot of solidarity, the governments and societies in Central Europe do a lot as far as this is concerned. And in Germany, too, there is a lot of solidarity and support for displaced persons and refugees. But we need to see the long term picture. Now, these are all challenges for the political sphere and we need to really ponder and reflect we need to be careful in what we do in order to not topple the democratic consensus according to which ukraine needs to be supported russia and the perspective dear sabine you've just said there is a lot of reputational damage to be seen as far as Russia is concerned. There are demonstrations all over the world against this war, and there is an economic impact which can be felt in the country too. And there is also a lot of resistance in Ukraine, and apparently Russia did not expect this resistance. And yet, we heard yesterday everything is going according to plan. I mean, there is a major difference between what we see and hear from Russia and what is being declared by the Kremlin. I mean, how long will it take until the population changes its mind or until we see a different mood in Russia? Last week, the Russian population lost its last tools to use in order to adopt a different perspective in view of Ukraine, i.e. different from what the propaganda and the media of the state say and show. This war is a tragedy for Russia. It's a tragedy for the Russian society, and you can hardly describe what is going on in this society right now. Now, the censorship, which has just been um, introduced, the relevant law was passed last Friday, i.e. one week ago, the last independent media have been sent silenced. I mean, they had been under major pressure for many years, but they have been completely destroyed since this war, since this law was passed. So there is a lot of isolationism in the foreign policy, a lot of um, distancing from the West, turning away from international contacts with the exception of few nations, including China. Now, the latest development has accomplished, so to speak, the isolation of Russia and projects into the country a picture of this war. I mean, everybody who is here in this webinar today, today certainly knows how this um, war is being depicted in Russia, it's a war against a so-called fascist junta in Kiev, and Russia has to intervene because people with Russian roots or of Russian origin in Ukraine are threatened, their lives are threatened. And Ukraine is not an independent player. It's absolutely instrumentalized. It's but a tool of the West and in particular of the USA. Now, this is the narrative. It's a defensive war, they say, or this narrative implies against Western aggression. And this claim has been made for more than 15 years in the Russian foreign policy. And this is the picture which is being projected inside of Russia these days. And unfortunately, I need to say, because you ask for a forecast or a prognosis, well, I do expect in the short term that the Russian system will remain stable. 
they will manage to maintain the system and via major repressions, they will crush any resistance even before it can really be lived out. I mean, we have been dealing with Russia for a long time already. And in the last 20 years, whenever people told me 2008 Georgia, 2014 Ukraine, when they said, this is the beginning of the end, I said, no, it's not. And now for the first time ever, I have the feeling that this could be the beginning of the end because in the mid run, because of the sanctions and because of the major impact of these sanctions for the economic situation within Russia makes me think that we are reaching a tipping point. The problem is the tipping point I see will only be a midterm one, which is difficult if you look at the military development in Ukraine. It's actually irrelevant what happens in Russia in the midterm for Ukraine. It would be very important to see short-term transformations and changes. So a domestic policy change in Russia is the only option Ukraine has so that there is change in the situation. Everything else is irrelevant for Ukraine today. Thank you very much. So this means that apart from the sanctions, we also have to fight disinformation, although this is becoming more and more difficult because more and more channels are being closed. And of course, we as a foundation are also dependent on that. Johannes, I would like to come back to the Ukrainian society. What is the impact on the Ukrainian society? And I'm not talking about the immediate impact, the destruction, the flight, uh, but the the impact in the medium term. So what kind of impact do you see for the Ukrainian society and the statehood? Well, of course, the statehood has become under pressure and we do not know how it will further develop. And um, based on all, I, all what I hear from uh, people in Ukraine, I know that there's a process of consolidation a uh, coming together of people and also an acknowledgement of their nationhood. There's a huge wave of support and uh, also the will to depend their own statehood. And we can only assume that uh, in the political elite in Russia, people did not see that uh, Ukraine is considerably differing from Russia in that respect, and that many people in Ukraine, when put under pressure from outside, or impose certain rules from outside, that they will not withdraw and be passive, but they become active and start to act. This is what we are actually seeing at the moment in Ukraine. So in this regard, it is quite an enormous push towards a nation building in terms of the statehood, we have to wait and see how the developments unfold over the next weeks. The relationship of the Ukrainians towards Russians and Russia, I mean, this is a huge catastrophe. Sabina has already mentioned that. So Russia is actually destroying a country and is going down as well. Um, in the medium term. And it's a tragedy because for decades to come, understandably so, um, it generates hate. And this hate is being passed along from one generation to the next. And this is happening at the heart of Europe. And this is really a tragic development. Thank you very much, uh, Johannes. I would like to talk about the EU briefly. So what does this war, this catastrophe, um, this um, tipping point uh, mean for the EU um, and its policy towards Eastern Europe? What needs to change? Do we need an institutional response? So what would you say, Robin? Well, what we do see at the moment is quite the opposite of what Putin always wanted. Putin's objective is the division of the EU, the division of the West, and we see uh, the opposite happening. 
but it also means that we have to improve the the tools that we have in our hands so we need an improvement when it comes to our joint foreign and security policy and this also means that we have to improve the decision making processes sometimes we are being hampered by the principle of unanimity but so this is actually a question of the institutions within the eu and to to tackle this issue and to start reforms eventually in order to be able to devise a uniform strategy for Europe as a whole towards Russia in the discussions about the strategic compass that are taking place at the moment are very important discussions that need to take place in order to find out how a European security pillar might look like. How can we act um, unanimously? And this is also an important part of the common foreign and security policy and the defense policy. And it, we are well advised to use the European instruments and to improve our cooperation. And at the moment, I do see that things are changing in Europe to uh, come to an, a unanimous agreement and also to embed this into the transatlantic uh, alliance. So this is not meant to be an opposition to uh, NATO, but um, together. But um, I think it's very important that we have these discussions and that we do not only think from a mere German perspective, only in the European context can we find the right strategy and tools and our EU partners uh, to our east. I mean, we have to acknowledge what they are uh, doing at the moment. They're showing uh, this huge solidarity with all the refugees of Poland, but also other countries who are really committed here. And we have to take the concerns seriously towards Russia uh, in the Baltic region and also in Poland. Um, so we do see now that they are not unjustified and we have to take this more into account uh, when it comes to our German perspective and we have to have more uh, stronger exchange and not only keep in mind our own the German perspective we have to keep in mind the European perspective and this also includes the Eastern European perspective of course thank you very much Sabina back to you would you like to follow up on that and next to the European perspective um, what about the German policy towards Russia? Because it's not always synchronized, so to speak. What does what needs to change in the German policy towards Russia? Well, I think Robin Wagner has um, described it very nicely and very comprehensively. First of all, the German and the European policy needs to tackle the challenges quickly and strategically that are being uh, created by this war in Ukraine. We've already touched upon them. In particular, it's about the economic repercussions and also the handling of uh, flight and the displacement in based on solidarity together with the Ukraine and our European partners. And I can only emphasize that we should not forget the kind of burden it places on the Eastern European member states. So this morning, and uh, Roman Wagner was present there as well, we have conducted a briefing at the SWP for members of the German parliament. And there we discussed cast the exact same thing at one participant and described how great the burden is for these societies and how high the risk is that these uh, societies that are still undergoing transformation might fail due to it. So we should not underestimate this because the political situation in these countries, be it in Poland or uh, the Slovak Republic or other countries, uh, is uh, already um, difficult and the number of people who are fleeing, the number of refugees is simply so high. So from my perspective, this is actually the most pressing issue at hand. And the third challenge, of course, is the risk or the danger of an escalation of the war beyond the borders of Ukraine. So these are the three main challenges that I do see that we need to tackle. 
and the structural and fundamental changes that need to take place in the realm of politics. Well, when you look at Germany and also the EU as a whole, I mean, it has always been a controversial topic, but simply because Germany has such a great weight in the EU, of course, it has largely um, co-determined or shaped uh, European politics. So here we need to follow three steps or see three steps or phases. Until 2014, people wanted to have a dialogue with um, uh, Russia. After 2014, uh, the annexation of Crimea and the Donbass um, actually already marked uh, the beginning of uh, the war with all its consequences. Uh, and now we just see an escalation of the war. So the war already started in 2014. So anyway, in 2014, the next element in politics were the sanctions. And now Germany, German politics, and also other EU members, from my point of view, simply need to accept that the next element that needs to be integrated into this new policy uh, needs to be defense. And this is bitter for many political actors in Germany and also other countries. Um, also, deterrence needs to be a part of it. And of course, Germany is not alone with some of the positions within the EU, but this is actually the major change that we need to see. So, because irrespective of the continuation of the war, how the war continues in Ukraine, and I'm a little cautious here in my um, uh, explanation, uh, we have to reckon with a further confrontation with Russia in the future. And another aspect I would like to bring up is that Russia will, in the medium, but also in the long term, no longer be a partner when it comes to tackling global challenges. And first of all, um, <clears throat> when it comes to climate change, I mean, there was a small window of opportunity one or two years ago, but I think that this will no longer be on their agenda because the political actors in Russia who were interested in it and still are, um, I don't want to neglect that, but at the moment they no longer participate in the decision-making processes there. Uh, and even with us, some actors now are doubting or putting question mark behind uh, climate policies. But Robin, you wanted to add something? Yes, I would like to add two um, thoughts to what Sabina Fischer has just said. Um, you just brought up the support for the refugees and I just talked about the European foreign and security policy and the question is what should the European response be? But when we pick up the term tipping point, or crossroads, then we have to admit that there will be massive consequences for a relationship with Russia and also um, our relationship with other autocracies. So this will have a massive impact. And this impact will be so far reaching. Germany is an important actor, but in some areas we're simply too small and some problems can only be tackled in together with the European partners. And uh, tonight I will also attend the cybersecurity event. Uh, so when I look at all the propaganda or also the impact on agriculture and global uh, food supply and also hunger, because the two main actors are now missing on the global market. So what does this mean for the world, but also the EU and the um, agriculture sector in the EU? And agriculture is one of the biggest sectors that we uh, focus on in the EU. And we will have to uh, accept uh, major upheavals here as well. And we will see an impact of the sanctions, but also an impact due to 
these consequences, and we always have to tackle it from a European perspective, national perspectives are um, uh, no longer sufficient when it comes to tackling this uh, comprehensive, this complex war. And another aspect is uh, in our relationship with Russia, but uh, this applies also to Belarus. We have to make quite clear that this is not a conflict with the Russian or Belarusian uh, population, but that these are conflicts that are uh, start, have been started by the autocrats. And also the population within Russia and Belarus are suffering from a lot of repression in Belarus. Uh, we have seen an increase in crackdown on people, on, on demonstrators, people have been detained or disappeared. But still people are protesting and standing up and risking a lot also in Russia, the protests that we've seen and continue to, to see. And it's quite encouraging to see this. And so this means that we have to support the civil society. This needs to be high on top of our political agenda. And to do that, we need to find the right tools because the traditional support tools uh, might no longer function, no longer work. Uh, I'm not sure when exactly this was, but we also conducted a Heinrich Böhr Foundation event on civil society uh, in the recent past, and already then we saw the changes, and increasingly so. So the things that we did in the past with the Russian civil society, for example, um, are no longer possible due to sanctions and other uh, uh, obstacles. But how can we refocus our instruments in or our tools in Germany so that we can continue to cooperate with the civil society in Russia and Belarus Russia, in order to maintain this exchange and this dialogue? Well, yes, this is, of course, very important for us as the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Robin, thank you for bringing it up. Of course, we have to work more strongly with the structures in exile. And it's quite interesting what you both brought up. This war is also some kind of catalyst for some political processes that were hampered for a longer period of time. And of course, I would also like to see this with a view to the European political arena. I'm not sure whether we will be able to launch the necessary political reforms. This is, of course, a very important aspect. But uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time a little bit. Um, I can already see 34 different questions to the panel. But before I uh, open this panel for the questions, I would like to ask a question to Johannes and uh, come back to Ukraine. Johannes, from your point of view, I think it's a little bit difficult for us to uh, digest when you say the sanctions have a certain impact and everything or nothing is very easy at the moment. Um, but is there anything that we could do at the moment to, uh, to provide immediate support? Because I think in particular for people in the audience who are from Ukraine, it's a little bit um, um, difficult. Of course, we all know about the complexity, but uh, do you have any ideas where you would suggest that we could do more or act differently? follows up nicely on what Sabine and Robin have said. We need to tell all the time when talking about Ukraine that this is about Ukraine. And even if there is a peace, the problem won't be solved because we do see a major ideological core in Russia, which is a threat in a competition of uh, countries with democracies and that goes beyond ukraine actually and we need to find out what to do in this situation and in view of this menace because we need to stick together in order to cope with this threat and this also means 
that we have to support Ukraine and other countries that want to get out of the rigid grip of Russia. But there are many levels on which we can do things. We can talk to many, many people. That's important in order to talk about the suffering in Ukraine. And then there is one important aspect which Robin has mentioned, and that's we need to differentiate. We should not go and say the Russian or the Russians did. We need to differentiate between those in Russia who are against the war or who are against the war but don't dare to speak up anymore. So the black and white picture should not be part of our perception. I, I hear that there is bullying of Russian pupils at schools here. I mean, we need to do something about it. This does not excuse an offensive war. No way. But we need to have the differentiated approach with respect to human beings and the leadership that wages this war. Otherwise, we will have problems here in the long run. Right, Sabine, it, an immediate answer or comment, and then I will open to the floor to the audience. Right, I would like to agree to what Johannes has just said, and I would like to add another aspect. I think it's extremely important to keep up your personal connections with Russia. If you have private contacts to people in Russia, stay in touch. Tell them that you know what's going on in Ukraine, but help them also keep up in order to not turn away from society. I mean, I'm very closely in touch with my friends in Russia. I mean, of course, they are in a precarious situation, in a difficult situation. I try to give support to them as well. But also, um, with those who I don't agree with when it comes to the war in Ukraine, because we need to make sure that something can be done against the false information they might get from the West. It's a niche, nothing but a small one. But as Robin has said, we need to use these niches to operate in the future. Thank you, Sabine. Now, Luisa, please tell us what are the questions from the audience? Well, there are lots of interesting questions and comments. And I would like to start with the ones which have been voted to the top, Russia. One question is, do you think that there is the possibility that parts of the Russian elite turns against Putin and thus threatens his power? And the question connected is, do we still know what the situation in the Russian elite is and what they think of Russia, of Putin. And one more question concerning Russia. What do we in Germany for the people in Russia who are against the war? How do we support them? Thank you, Luisa, who would like to answer? Maybe Sabine first. Yeah, I will start. Now, indeed, that's a key question. Angesichts dessen, wie das politische System aufgebaut ist und aufgrund der Tatsache, dass der russische Staat noch mal also in view of the very structure of the Russian system and also in view of what the Russian government has done in the last few years in view of resistance and opposition, we do have a major vacuum, a deep, deep gap between the Russian leadership and the country, the government of the country. So this is a really dangerous constellation, I'd say. Therefore, if you want internal change, you need to look at the constellation of the elites. I mean, this is a decisive aspect of any future system in Russia. Right now, I don't see any members of the elite turn away from Putin there was a kind of cautious criticism of some of the oligarchs 
who are actually no oligarchs who are part of the power structures. But right now, I don't see anyone turn away or move away from the center of power. And this goes in particular for the representatives in the security sector. I mean, this is not necessarily a given for long because the Russian system will be under a lot of financial and economic pressure in the months and years to come. But this, as I said before, is a rather midterm development. It's not going to happen in the short term. Now, what can we do for those in Russia who are against the war? Now, we've made proposals already, the three of us. We need to bear in mind that things will furthermore change in Russia. And since I talked about displacement and refugees before, and the impact this has on us, now, since you have a major Russian and Russian-speaking community in Germany already, now the Ukrainian community is getting stronger too, and they are traumatized on top. So we need to have this or keep this in, in mind in order to protect the peace in Germany. So more and more people will need help in Russia too. And they will be important partners for us in the future in order to stay in touch with the Russian society. And they also need uh, less red tape with respect to the support. That's what I would like to add in my capacity as a host. Anything to add, Robin, Johannes? Well, actually, we don't know what will happen because it's really difficult to get insights into the close circles of the power. But I agree whenever, whatever might happen in terms of change, it won't be a short-term process. We need to see the impact of the sanctions for the Russian civil society, and we also need to see the impact of the losses of the Russian military. We don't have the figures. We know the uh, Ukrainian news, but we don't have our own numbers here. But this will certainly have an impact on the families of the soldiers killed in this war. There are many drafted soldiers in Russia, as the Russian government has admitted recently, finally. But how many? We don't know. And to what extent they are affected, we don't know either. So something is bound to happen, but when? We don't know. It's also going to happen on different levels, like there will be an impact on the level of the elite. And then you also have movements, people turning away from the Duma, sorry, from Putin in the um, group of Duma members, and then among the oligarchs. And I think Sabine Fischer has described quite well what might happen, but uh, since we are dealing with a very condensed power structure, it's hard to check what really is going on and whatever is going on will happen in the mid or long run. But we do see that Putin reacts in view of pressure from the outside. And we also see this in the comments of the oligarchs. It's also getting more difficult to get information from Ukraine in this situation. Well, Johannes, if you don't want to comment on this particular question, I would like to ask for the next questions. Well, yes, I do want to speak up. And I would like to mention the security services. 
I mean, there are voices in Russia, people who say we need more sanctions. That's, so to speak, the second layer or tier. But then there are those who say we will lose more in a process of change. The tipping point has not been reached yet, but we haven't reached it yet. Now, as far as the oligarchs are concerned, they are actually integrated. They are integral parts of the system, so I would not really rely on them. And also the so-called financial liberals, I mean, they don't have a say, they don't really matter. And also authorities connected to this segment of society are not really important. So it's first and foremost the security services, and I guess it will take some time until the tipping point will be reached. Right, Luisa, more questions, please. Now there are two questions concerning to, concerning the strategy of the federal government. One being, how does the German government want to make sure that humanitarian offers for Ukrainian refugees don't rely on voluntary help only? And then which programs are planned in order to help them? And what can be done in order to allow for a discrimination-free access to the support also for Syrian and other refugees? And there is another question concerning what is being done in the German parliament with respect to security policy and energy sovereignty. Well, I guess Robin Wagner is the one who is closest to the uh, Bundestag. So he will certainly answer the questions from the deputy perspective. Also the one about refugees. Well, uh, I don't know which programs are being undertaken right now in detail. I would have to double check what is going on right now, but I know that we started implementing programs quickly together with the Red Cross and the Foreign Office. We're also using the um, resources we have in order to set up humanitarian structures, help, help, help structures. Of course, we do see a lot of voluntary support that's all over the EU at the same time. I do see that public institutions are also ramping up their resources and activities in order to help and communities and municipalities and local authorities check what can be done in order to take in even more refugees. But uh, when it comes to support for the refugees, I'd like to say that voluntary support is very important. And also major organizations need those volunteers. But yeah, I cannot tell you more about these programs. I'm not an expert in this field, but I can tell you there are such programs. Now, energy supply, what can we do in order to be less depending? Well, that's certainly one of the main issues we are dealing with, is we know that security is also about energy sovereignty. We do have an agreement covering a 200 billion euro packet adopted just last week. So we will have to invest more in order to establish the generation capacities, the distribution capacities. We need to do more in the field of research. I mean, you know, this is hydrogen, this is energy storage capacities. There are lots of fields we need to see in order to make funds available licensing that's also very important granting permits for plans i mean this is also about operations and procedures in germany we need to be quick in order to get results quickly but this does not only involve laws it also involves capacities on the spot the legal capacities in the respective courts 
when it comes to generation plants, it's to be seen as well. I mean, it's good that you have the rule of law and that people can sue companies that want to operate generation facilities in a given municipality. But we need to make sure that these procedures happen quickly so that can be done a lot and a lot is happening. And then there was another question. Right, refugees. Um, differentiation between Ukrainian refugees and other refugees. Well, we have seen that there are distinctions made at the borders. Ukrainians come in, Syrians need to stay outside. We do see a lot of racism and discrimination. Now, Syrian refugees even need to move away in Berlin. That's an example from Berlin in order to have Ukrainian refugees find a home. I mean, that's not the way to go. And I guess the Ukrainians don't want it that way either. Right. This must not happen. But we get these reports and we need to double check what happens, really. And what can be done in order to overcome this problem? We also need to see who can get out of Ukraine. What about the immigration processes and who can get in? What about EU procedures? And I mean, there were cases of discrimination. We heard horrible reports from the first days when at the border some were turned away and others were allowed to enter the EU territories, and I even talked to the ambassador myself, and this was not based on a political program. This happened at the borders, but they tried to make sure that this was not happening or could not happen again. Carly was at the border recently in order to double check, make sure that this does not happen. It must not happen. And I have the impression that nobody wants it to happen. So we need to bear in mind that sometimes things happen you don't want to happen. Now, as far as the reception is concerned, we need a discrimination-free reception of refugees. And here I'm also thinking of uh, refugees from Belarus who were in Ukraine and now try to move on. I mean, for Ukrainians, it's quite possible to get in because there are the respective instruments and tools. But what about Belarusian refugees? They also have to get an opportunity to uh, come in, right? And of course, we need to make sure that we have enough capacities because, because we do not want to have one group displace the other because we need the solidarity of everyone and i think politicians are the ones who have to double check that this is given yeah. oh, the next uh, round of questions yes um, the next question evolves around the increase of the defense budget and what this increase uh, might or what kind of impact it might have on germany as a humanitarian soft power for example and there's another question in this regard whether there are still pacifist de-escalating measures undertaken I would like to pass this on to Robin again, but the others can also uh, um, add to that. Well, first of all, from a political point of view, I would distinguish between de-escalation and pacifist tools. A mere pacifist policy um, is not what we see at the moment, that's true. So at the moment we focus on different aspects of security that we need, and it is right that a part of it is military security, which means that we need to invest in our armed forces, which need to be capable to act. And 
on the one hand, you can do it by funding it, by funds, but this is not sufficient. Also, the structures need to be adapted, need to be reformed so that uh, the right things are being achieved with the funding. So on the one hand, the question is how or what do we want to fund? But on the other hand is the procurement segment and other aspects. So we have to uh, make sure that the right things are being done with the funding. But the military structures, the military aspects are just one part, one aspect. Of course, it will never be, um, it will never achieve peace as such, uh, but it can create a situation where others can try to create a peace. So, we also need to provide funding for development cooperation, for um, peace uh, creating measures, etc. So we need to invest in these structures, um, but this is not something that prevents us from investing in our armed forces. We need both. We need military security and we need also the other aspects of international work uh, and we need to increase the funding there as well. And the third aspect, of course, is the question of energy sovereignty and energy security, which is an area where we have to invest even more because um, we see this even bigger backlog here. So these are the instruments that we have to invest in, and these are the tools that I've just mentioned that we need in um, development cooperation, uh, service or prevention. Uh, etc. So these are the instruments that we need. Thank you very much. Sabine, you wanted to uh, add to it? Yes, very briefly, two points. On the one hand, I wanted to emphasize uh, the following. I think in the discussion about de-escalation passive Fism. I would also see this distinction similar to Robin, but I think it's very important to emphasize this in this discussion. At the moment, we see a war of aggression and an unprovoked, unjustified war of aggression. So this is actually the characteristic along the line of which our measures need to be seen. And the second aspect is diplomacy is happening. It's simply not true that diplomatic channels have been stopped. Diplomacy is happening at the moment. And to an enormous extent, even before this uh, attack on Ukraine, we saw a lot of diplomacy. Simply remember the phase between uh, beginning of January and February the 24th. It was so intensive that it was difficult to keep track of all these phone calls, um, visits, etc. But it did not have an effect. So, but now diplomacy is going on, it's continuing. All stakeholders are involved. Um, Lavrov met uh, the Ukrainian foreign minister Kuliba yesterday uh, in Antalya. Scholz uh, called Putin and others called Putin. So uh, there is a real um, attempt being made to de-escalate. But the problem is the Russian uh, stance here. This is what I wanted to emphasize. And uh, excuse me. And one further point on diplomacy and peace efforts or peace creating efforts. Look at the asymmetry at the conflict level. So the Russian stance and the Ukrainian approach. So Zelensky over the past days, also shortly before uh, the meetings, uh, has made quite far reaching suggestions from the point of view of Ukraine. And now we see the results. So the political leadership in Ukraine is in terms of de-escalation and diplomacy is miles ahead of the Russian uh, side. Okay, thank you. Luisa, yes, I think many people are also interested in the role of China and we, there are several concrete questions. So how do you assess the current uh, importance of China, in particular as a partner for Russia, and also the past role of an alleged mediator. So do you see a, a chance for mediation while keeping up the sanctions by the EU? This is also a very important player that we've not yet uh, touched upon. So who of you would like to talk about that? 
Well, I can uh, start and, uh, and uh, the others can and chime in with their analyses and their ideas. Uh, the role of China, of course, is uh, the right topic for the past 50 minutes here, <clears throat> because it's very difficult to assess China's role here at the moment. On the one hand, China is highly interested in seeing the reactions, the response, how unanimously is the West reacting. So this is, of course, very interesting for China. They simply want to test the West's reaction. And I'm quite glad that we could show this unanimous response. This is quite a clear and important signal which will have an impact far beyond Ukraine. It will also be seen in China. So from the Chinese point of view, it might also be beneficial that the US is now more strongly focusing on Europe and to a lesser extent on uh, Southeast Asia. However, the US should not neglect the Southeast Asia at the moment because China is becoming more and more active with a massive arms build up. So the Chinese People's Army has seen an increase in funding and um, also we also see how powerful China is from an economic point of view. So, but as I said, it might be of interest to China to see a deviation of the attention. And despite all autocratic fraternalism that we've seen recently between Putin and Xi and others, I think China is also very interested in a functioning global market. This is actually a factor that plays a major role in China. And uh, I think that China is quite concerned about the current development. I think it was quite a good sign that China abstained from the vote in the Security Council. It was great to see that China was going as far as abstaining. Uh, however, this also shows the ambivalence in the Chinese approach to this conflict, to this war. At the moment, I think that China has um, a huge interest in a functioning world market, which will also determine uh, China's actions. Thank you. Sabine or Johannes, would you like to add to it? Well, I uh, have a similar view. I think China will not withdraw its political support for Russia, although this is a support that is largely taking place at the rhetorical level. And of course, Russia can uh, be assured of that, of course. I mean, it would be a huge change in China's policy if they would actually withdraw this uh, rhetorical support. But China and Chinese banks and companies um, will make a huge effort here to uh, limit the impact of the Western sanctions to their economy. And China will, of course, continue to have strong economic ties with Russia. And we also have to assume that when the Western states, the West becomes more and more independent of Russian energy exports, Russia will focus more strongly on China. But in terms of economic relations and trade, China is always very much focused on its own interests. So Russia has lost the West as a technology and innovation partner due to the sanctions at the moment. And China will not be a sufficient replacement for it. It will simply consider Russia and treat Russia as an energy supplier. And so Russia is also very realistic about it. Shortly before the war was started, I talked to colleagues in Russia in these foreign policy circles, and they're quite realistic about it. They say China will make sure that we can go on, but 
nothing more. So this is actually also my assessment of the Chinese policy in the medium term over the next years, if there should not be any, or unless there are any fundamental changes in terms of domestic policy in Russia. Well, this is actually a huge topic. Thank you very much. But we are coming to the end of our event. So I would suggest that we will pick up one more topic or question, Luisa, and the answer to this question will be actually also the opportunity to conclude this panel and then our time is over. Well, maybe we can come back to the situation in Ukraine. There were people in the audience asking about humanitarian aid. How can the further distribution at the border work or does it work at all? And which humanitarian organizations, for example, Caritas and others uh, have still access? And another question was, how is the situation in Mariupol at the moment? Thank you very much. I think this is very good that we see this question at the end of this event. And I see Sophia uh, showing her hand. Could you please turn on your camera? She wants to say something. Sophia? Sophia? I saw your yep. raised hand. Uh, yeah, I think it should work right now. I guess uh, I wanted to join at this specific moment because as it directly concerns Ukraine and as the situation in Mariupol, I would start with this one is uh, really deteriorating because the people are taking hostages and they're in the shelters for more than a week already and the shellings continue and there is no humanitarian aid which is, uh, that could access the city. Any evacuation corridor was impossible because the shellings were continuing and if the evacuation was possible in terms of other cities, Mariupol is not a case. And we face here exactly the humanitarian crisis there because people are without electricity, water, and any food and any medicine. Like this is what we saw with the maternity, uh, maternity hospital and the uh, children there. This is a nightmare. This is what cannot happen and this is a complete violation of the Geneva Convention. And this is not how the war can take place. In terms of how you can support Ukraine and what you can do. It's first and foremost in terms of a humanitarian aid. Uh, there are like indeed Caritas and Red Cross Society, but it's also a lot of volunteers working and collecting in specific cities. So there are volunteer centers I know across Poland, in uh, in Brussels itself, uh, there are lots of my friends who are collecting uh, the different humanitarian aid and sending to Ukraine. There are all coming either to different parts uh, at the border, either it's in Uzhorod in uh, Zakarpatia or Lviv, a big chunk come, is coming to Lviv or to Volin, and then it's distributed and sent out to different parts of Ukraine. So it's a challenge right now to distribute it, but it's essential that it's coming because then it goes to Kharkiv, it goes to areas of Kyiv and, uh, and across Ukraine, and also lots of uh, people are right now in the Western Ukraine who left their homes only with one backpack and they need, uh, they need stuff here as well. Yes. So uh, in any case, it is... Uh, and I would definitely advise you, I will send the, the link uh, afterwards or post uh, where, what organizations, uh, for example, I, I would definitely recommend supporting. But uh, in uh, in any, even in a small municipality, there are those volunteer centers or uh, information available also on the websites of the embassies uh, that, we, that can be supported uh, as well. Thank you very, very much, Sophia. I think this is very important. And please send us the link. Uh, Johannes, would you like to add to this? Also, jede Form von Unterstützung ist well, ganz wichtig. Any form of support is absolutely uh, necessary and great um, because it's also very important for the people in Ukraine that we send out the signal that we are well aware of the situation in Ukraine, what is happening there, and that we know about the horrible situation there, that this is not being forgotten in Europe. Despite all the other problems that uh, Germany or Europe uh, faces, it's always very important to show time and again that we do see what is happening. And um, in the framework in which it is possible for every individual, we should continue to support Ukraine. And um, for example, and this is what I read this morning, it might simply be sufficient to lower your heating at home in order to reduce, at least to a slight extent, the dependency on Russian gas. And um, so this is an indirect support, or you could also support the Ukrainians directly. 
as viele tun. If many people are doing it, this would actually be a major help and it's always very important to um, convey this back to Ukraine. We know what is happening. We will not forget you. We will act. Thank you very much, Johannes. And of course, also donations. Um, time is running out, Robin and uh, Sabine, but I would like to give you the opportunity to say a final word very briefly, Robin. Well, I cannot add anything to it um, after this impressive voice from Ukraine and what she's described. I do not want to add anything in terms of content, but I think it's very important to hear these voices. We ha also have to say um, we do hear you and we do whatever we can do, um, we as a society and we as a state. And this is in line with what Johannes just mentioned, because Ukraine has not yet fallen and democracy has not yet fallen and it will not happen if we stand by Ukraine's side and this is what we will do. Thank you very much. This is a great final word. I would like to thank you. It was extremely um, important. There's a lot of solidarity with Ukraine and it will uh, continue, I'm sure. And in particular for people who are very close to Ukraine, it's quite frustrating to see that we cannot do everything in the short term to stop the war, but we have already seen that in the medium term, a lot is going to change. And so far, it's very important to maintain this show of solidarity. And I think this is what we need to work on. And we also have to find fight disinformation. And I can only say that we will have follow-up events. We will also discuss individual aspects of this complex issue. I would like to thank uh, all the people um, in the audience that we cannot see here, but I think the questions were great. And I'd also like to uh, um, thank the panel for your short-term acceptance and have a nice day. Thank you very much.